We talked about the gleanings of a formal legalist, part two. Talked about part one last week, and we'll share a little bit in review here. And I encourage you to take out your outline, take out your extra page of notes that I put in there as well, and uh, give you plenty of study material long beyond the sermon. But we're in Hebrews chapter three this morning, verses one through six. It says, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we open the word. We thank you that it has power to change our lives, to transform us. We thank you that it doesn't return void as it goes out. And we pray you'll help us to come with open hearts, to listen, to receive from the Holy Spirit, from your word, what you have to give to each one of us today. We thank you that you know the individual needs of each heart in this room, and you know exactly what they need. And I pray through this message that you would uh, speak to them, encourage them, challenge us, convict us, whatever we need, Lord. We ask that you do your work, and we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Brennan Manning, in his book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, he said this, put bluntly, the American church today accepts grace in theory, but denies it in practice. We say we believe that the fundamental structure of reality is grace, not works, but our lives refute our faith. By and large, the gospel of grace is neither proclaimed, understood, nor lived. Too many Christians are living in the house of fear and not in the house of love. And that's the battle that each and every one of us face when we think of this idea of the law and grace and how we are to live that out. Last week I shared in the message the purposes of the law, mainly to show us our sin, that we can't live up to the law, and the solution is found in the finished work of Jesus Christ, as we just sang, lead us to the cross. The finished work of Christ, when he said it is finished, it was accomplished. The law is given to us to understand who our creator is and how he has designed our lives and the reality around us to live best for him. We talked about the attitudes that develop as a result of living and following the law legalistically. And then we talked about in comparison and contrast to that, the attitudes that develop as a result of following by grace the law of Christ and the law of the spirit, which we're going to unpack today in this message. We talked about living in tension between law and grace. We summed that message up by saying as New Testament Christ followers, God is interested in a heart relationship with the Father to follow the law of Christ, the law of the Spirit, motivated by love and empowered by the Holy Spirit that lives within us as believers in Christ. We've talked about the law in previous sermons, so this morning we're going to look at the law in the New Testament as Jesus and others gave it to us by grace in love, to obey by the power of the Holy Spirit. First thing on your outline there is Jesus came to fulfill the law and carry out its intended purposes. Jesus came to fulfill the law and carry out its intended purpose. Jesus did not come to destroy the law. It tells us in Matthew 5, 17 through 18, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, the smallest punctuation will pass from the law until all is accomplished. This, these two verses are central to our discussion and understanding of how we as Christ followers are to relate to the Old Testament law. Jesus came to express the eternal word of the Lord that will last into eternity. And despite what the Pharisees said, Jesus came to fulfill and not abolish the law given to Moses in the Ten Commandments. 
and the first five books of the Old Testament. The Jews know it as the Torah. We call it the, the Pentateuch. So consider what Jesus did not do in his ministry in Matthew 5, 17. Jesus says he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. In other words, Jesus' purpose was not to abrogate the word, to dissolve it or render it invalid. The prophets had their, will have their fulfilled prophecies uh, filled in the future. And the law will continue to accomplish its purpose for which it was given. In Isaiah 55, it tells us in verses 10 through 11, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Just as God sends the rain and the snow to water the ground, to provide nourishment for the seeds to grow, so God's word will continue on to carry out his work and accomplish his purpose. Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophets in that his first coming alone. He fulfilled hundreds of prophecies concerning himself. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law in at least two ways. He was a teacher and he was a doer of the law. He taught people to obey the law, Matthew 22, Mark 1. He obeyed the law himself, John 8, 1 Peter 2. And think about this. In living a perfect life, Jesus fulfilled the moral laws, which is part of the law of the Old Testament. But then in his sacrificial death, Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial laws laws. Christ came not to destroy the old religious system, but to build upon it. He came to finish the old covenant and establish the new covenant. Next, we see Jesus is the culmination. He's the climax of the law. Jesus came to earth, followed the law perfectly, and gave us an example of how to fulfill the law. A very important verse, John, I mean Romans, Romans 10, 4 says this, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. In his fulfillment of the law and prophets, Jesus obtained our eternal salvation. No more priests required to offer sacrifices than enter the holy place, according to Hebrews 10. Jesus has done that for us once and for all. By grace through faith, we are made right with God because of his sacrifice. In Colossians 2.14, it says, by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands, thus this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He took our punishment upon himself that we deserve. And if Jesus did not come to abolish the law, as he stated in Matthew 5.17, then what is meant by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, ordinances in Ephesians 2.15? In Ephesians 2, 14 and 15, put 14 in there for some context. For Christ himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. In verse 15, we're going to try to figure out by abolishing the law of commands expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. The word translated abolish there in verse 15 of Ephesians 2 there, means to render inoperative or to remove all power from. Paul's intent is to say that the purpose of the law had been completed. He calls the law good in other places, as we said in Romans 7 and 1 Timothy 1. Yet his emphasis here is that it's no longer separating the Jews and Gentiles from one another. Instead, the focus of a believer should be on common salvation in Jesus which makes us one family. And that's the purpose of Ephesians 2, 11 through 20. And we'll read that lengthier context in just a few moments. But Jews and Gentiles were enemies because the Jews sought to keep the law with its commandments and regulations, and the Gentiles were totally ignorant and unconcerned with the law. The difference was like a barrier between them. But now that the law is inoperative, Christ is the end of the law, as we said in Romans 10.4. Jewish-Gentile hostility is now gone. Some translations, like King James Version and New American Standard, give the idea that the law was the enmity or the hatred, but that is wrong. The law was the cause of the hatred, the hostility. Christ destroyed the barrier 
by making the law inoperative. In John 8.32, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let me emphasize that when we are set free from the consequences and the demands of the Old Covenant, the old traditions and rituals laid out in the Old Testament, Jesus brings us the law of Christ and the law of the Spirit to be obeyed by the motivation of love and the power of that divine nature, the Holy Spirit that lives within us because of his imputed righteousness. That's righteousness that Christ gave to us. And we have a new responsibility that we'll see in a moment. So our application is this. The Christ follower is not under the law of Moses, but now we're living in the law of Christ. We're not under that law. It was the platform. It was the the foundation. It was to be the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But now we're living in Christ. Second, by fulfilling the law, Christ brings a new way of life for his followers. Jesus came to establish the new covenant, one of his purposes for coming to earth. He came to establish the new covenant, and the old covenant was a shadow of what was to come in the new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, it says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The new covenant, the law written on our hearts, the Holy Spirit given to us. And to fully understand the transition to the new covenant, one would need to study Leviticus and other parts of the Torah to understand the Old Testament law in relation to the book of Hebrews. And if you're reading today in the Word from Moody this month, it's interesting, they're going through the book of Hebrews. And the theme of Hebrews is that Jesus came to provide a better way, a better way. Let me give you a sample of that in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it could never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they, have not, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. When they sacrificed in the Old Testament temple, it was a covering over the sin until Jesus came and took the sin completely away. It was temporary in the Old Testament. In Hebrews 9.24, for Christ has entered not only into holy places made with hands, which are the copies, again the shadow, or the copies of true things, but into heaven himself, now to appear the presence of God on our behalf. The tabernacle, the temple, was just a shadow of what heaven is. And Jesus has entered it to make the plea for our final sacrifice and to be our high priest and intercessor. Well, I have to stop here, but the depth of this can only be known if you study thoroughly the book of Hebrews which shows you that the Old Testament law was a revelation for the Jews to live by faith with a constant view to the future that a Messiah was coming. He was going to come on the scene to lead them to a better way and even, the, even eventually the perfect way to heaven. We see also the Old Covenant kept the Jews and the Gentiles separate, but the New Covenant unites them in Christ. Let's look at that passage again. I encourage you to take your Bible look at Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll look at this in detail, 11 through 20, to understand what Christ did by tearing down this wall. Can you imagine in the early church when the Jewish believers first coming to Christ and it was revealed to them that they would be sitting in their ecclesia, their assemblies together with Gentile believers? It had to be a really difficult thing for a long time till they got used to the fact that they were not separated anymore, but one in Christ. And Ephesians 2 talks about this. In Ephesians 
Paul said, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Pretty grim situation for the Gentiles. But verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. So now we go back to Galatians 3.28. We think about there's, you know, in Christ, everyone is same, Jew and Gentile, man and woman, slave and master. For he himself is our peace, it says here, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments that he might create himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple to the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. You are his holy temple. And anyone who knows Christ as Savior, we are one in the body of Christ. One aspect of the new covenant that Jesus proclaimed at the Last Supper and brought into practice at the cross was that the Jews and Gentiles will become that one body in Christ. And then we see Paul flesh that out in 1 Corinthians 12. We see it in 1 Corinthians 14. We see it in Romans 12. He talks about the body of Christ and the spiritual gifts that he has apportioned to his followers. In Ephesians 4.4, 4, Paul said, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. In John 11.25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. In Christ, we have life in this new covenant. In John 4.4, 4, in Christ was life, and life was the light of men. So our application here is that Jesus came to transition from the law that condemns to grace that brings life. He was the resurrection and the life. He came to remove the condemnation, remove the consequences of sin that was upon us because we couldn't keep the law. But then brings us grace that brings life. I want to focus on two terms you will see in the New Testament that describe the law we are under now, the law of Christ, and then our last point, the law of the Holy Spirit, or next to the last point, because both the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ are part of the Trinity. These two terms are merely descriptors of the same law we're to heed as Christ's followers. So here's a very, uh, just a sampling, because there's hundreds and hundreds of verses as we think about this law of Christ, Jesus came to give us the law of Christ, which takes the Old Testament law and then exceeds it. He takes it to another level. Remember the difference between those believers who followed the Old Testament law and those in the church age in the current era we live in who follow the laws of Christ and the law of spirit. We both do it by faith in God. The Old Testament believers followed the laws with the Holy Spirit and of course the Holy Spirit came and left. He didn't abide and dwell like he does today and stay. They had to sacrifice animals to pay for their failures in keeping the law. And all the sacrifices were pointing to the final sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But in our church age, in the current era that we live in, we look back to the cross of Christ and trust by faith in the grace that was displayed by Christ on the cross and made available for us to accept and receive. 
It tells us in Romans 5.5, 5, we are filled with God's love when we receive the Holy Spirit, and now we're motivated by that love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we can fulfill the New Testament covenant that Jesus and the other letter writers in the New Testament fleshed out for us to follow in order to glorify the Lord and live well with our fellow man. We look briefly at the law of Christ. First in the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, you begin to see the law of Christ unfold, how he builds on the Old Testament law and then exceeds it. In verses 2 through 12 of Matthew 5, Christ shared who would be blessed nine times and what we should aspire to. And then on the screen, look at Matthew 5.13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So I did some study on this verse. What is a salt covenant? And where does this idea of being the salt of the earth come from? There's more to salt than meet the taste buds. Salt has been used in many cultures as a valuable commodity. Did you know that the word salary comes from the ancient word meaning salt money, referring to Roman soldiers' allowance for the purchase of salt? Someone who earns his pay is still said to be worth his salt. Salt has also been used to express promises and friendship between people. It was even considered by the Greeks to be divine. Today, in many Arab cultures, if two men partake of salt together, they're sworn to protect one another, even if previously they had been enemies. In some cultures, people throw salt over their shoulders when they make a promise. Who knew sodium chloride was so important? But in the ancient world, ingesting salt was a way to make an agreement legally binding. If two parties entered into an agreement, they would eat salt together in the presence of witnesses, and that act would bind their contract. And you know, this is referred to in 2 Chronicles 13.9 in King Abijah's speech. He said, Ought you not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingship over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt? Here, Abijah refers to the strong, legally binding promise of God to give Israel to David and his sons forever. The idea of a salt covenant carries a great deal of meaning because of the value of salt. And so when Jesus told his disciples that they were the salt of the earth, he meant that believers have value in this world and are to have a preserving influence on the culture. The salt covenant is never explicitly defined in the Bible, but we can infer from the understanding of salt's value in the context in which salt covenant is mentioned, that it has to do with the keeping of promises and with God's will toward man. Here's just one simple understanding, think about it, of how he builds on the Old Testament law and expands it. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, Jesus talking about anger, he said, you've heard that it was said to those of old, the Old Testament law, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But Jesus says, guess what? But I say, I'm going to add to that law, to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Jesus quotes the Old Testament law, and then he says, but I say, he takes it up a notch. And we see, talking about anger, Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Back in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, in, a, in Matthew chapter 5, he talks about lust, Jesus does. He says, you've heard it said, or you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Notice what he says next. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. 
For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Wow. Jesus takes and he amplifies. He takes it to another level. And we, out of motivated by love, powered by the Holy Spirit, we try to obey what it says. Here's another one, Matthew 5, 40 through 42. Several things here. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let them have your coat as well. Don't just give them what the lawsuit's talking about. Go beyond and give them something else, your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, the Jews were told that if the Roman soldiers came and say, carry my armor one mile, you had to do that. Jesus says, go with them two miles. Go beyond. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Do you get the idea? The law of the spirit or the law of Christ is actually uh, taking us on to another level beyond the commandments that were listed in the Old Testament. This is just a small, small sample of the law of Christ. You could do a study of it and you should so that you know what's expected of you as a follower of Christ in the current time of history we live in. We're to contextualize these laws of Christ to fit in our relationship with God and our fellow man here in the 21st century. The law of Christ can be summed up in the great commandment and all his teachings. And the other New Testament writers speak to the day-to-day ways to specifically live out the great commandment. In Mark 12, it says that one of the scribes came to Jesus and heard them disputing with one another, seeing that he answered them well and asked him which commandment is the most important of all. And Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6.5, the Shema. He says, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Then he quotes from Leviticus. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. All the law of Christ, all the law of the Spirit builds out from That great commandment, those two ideas there. And then we see the one another's. So take out your extra paper today, and you'll see on one side, I give you the one another's. There's about 30 of them, 30 of them. These are all part of the law of Christ, the things that we are to do motivated by love, empowered by the Holy Spirit to carry these things out. And then you see on the back, I give you something that Terry Kinright gave to our Connect group a few weeks ago. Eight things to think about, questions to consider about am I a legalist? So I encourage you to take that home and, and look at that in detail. But our application under this point is this. Christ came to show us how to go above and beyond in our obedience of the law motivated by love not a ritual. It's not a checklist. It's not we do this outwardly and our heart isn't in it. Our heart has to be in it. We're empowered by the love of God that's been given to us in his grace and the Holy Spirit. Next, we need to look briefly at and understand the law of the Spirit. The law of the Spirit. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit so that we would have the law of the Spirit living in our hearts. And Jesus saw that promise fulfilled in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit came down upon those that were assembled in the upper room. We see freedom from the law of sin. The law of the Spirit gives us freedom from the law of sin and death. In Romans 8, 2, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. This law principle set me free from the law of sin and death is from... In the Greek there, it's talking about a once-for-all act that occurred, the death of Jesus on the cross, saying it is finished, but then the continuous action as a result of that. So the law set me free from the law of sin and death. That principle is called the principle of sin and death because sin, as Paul said repeatedly, produces death. As the principle of sin, it contrasts with the Holy Spirit As the principle that brings death, it contrasts with the Holy Spirit who gives life. And then 
the law of the Spirit gives us freedom to meet the righteous requirements of the law through that Spirit. In Romans 8, 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You should be so thrilled today that we, trusting in what Christ did for us on the cross, giving us, he giving us our divine nature, that we have the ability to meet the righteous requirements of the law that enables us to go into heaven and to be with our Lord and Savior for all of eternity. And it gives us abundant life here on this earth. So here's the application. The great news is that Christ's followers have been released from the law of sin and eternal destruction to a new way to live in the law of the Spirit. Isn't that great news? That's the gospel. That's what we share with people. That all of us, we're going to face our mortality, that we're going to come to a place where we have our funeral. But guess what? We can have hope beyond the grave because we're not bound by the law of sin and death anymore, but we have the freedom of the law of the Spirit that gives us life. I could go on and on, but I hope you get the point. Christ with the Holy Spirit brings us a better way to live. Looking back to the finished work of the cross that puts all this action and motion within the heart and soul of the New Testament Christ follower. Then Paul goes on to show us how to live with one another in Christ, with differences and convictions, but stay in harmony and maintain unity by following the common good. So I got to this point of writing my sermon and I realized that I would need another 15 minutes. So we're not going to do much with this last point but I will give you the blanks because some of you are type A and you don't want to leave without the blanks being filled in, right? But Jesus allows our consciences touched by the Holy Spirit to understand how to live in the areas of our life that are not spelled out clearly in Scripture and in unity with fellow Christ followers. With this point, I wanted to get down to the very nitty-gritty of everyday life of how we can live free in Christ but not be a stumbling block to other believers or non-believers because of our freedom, because some of our different views of convictions and things like that. So I don't have time. We're going to share this as a sermon at the end of the book of Galatians. This will be a little teaser, but just remember this in Romans 14, 7, as we think about our freedom in Christ, it says, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. We can proclaim our freedom in Christ and we can have freedom between us and our Lord. But we also need to realize that there's a balance that everyone doesn't share the same convictions that we have. And so there's a tension on how we live these principles out. You'll see this, the command. I want to give you three things today. Command is when God tells you to do something and demands our obedience. And that's what we've been talking about. These were the laws. These were the things laid out. These are the commands that God wants us to do. But conviction is God speaking to your heart through the Holy Spirit about what you should or should not do in an area that's not a command based on scriptural principles. For example, the Bible doesn't speak about movies, entertainment choices, social media. But there's principles that you can go to and find. And if we sat down with 10 of us in a room... We might have different convictions about some of those things. Wearing makeup for ladies or not wearing makeup, tattoos, piercings, alcohol use, tobacco use. Now in many states and probably soon all across the United States, marijuana will become legal. And how do we deal with that with our convictions? Playing cards, dancing, fashion choices. What does modesty and dress look like? Bible translations to use, music choices, material wealth, and on it goes. And so we individually have to come to the word, the principles of the word, and through our life experiences and many things to develop these convictions, but at the same time not impose those on others who may have different views. And that's what Romans 14 and 15 is all about. And then preference. Preference is what you like or feel will help you in your spiritual growth and worship of God. So, for example, when I was in Christian college, we had to sign a document called the Liberty Way in Liberty University, and you had to sign this document saying you agreed with all the the things that they had. 
And a lot of it was housekeeping rules and how to do things and have order and consistency and so on and so on. They weren't based in scripture. They were preferences to everybody getting along and working together. Danny was in the army. When you signed up for the army, they had some preferences, didn't they? A lot of them, right? When you joined the VFW, when you joined anything, you have preferences that they say are imposed upon you because you joined that group. Rules to live by to make life easier and consistent for all. So as we close, you need to keep those in balance and understand those. When we talk about them more in detail. But the application here is living in tension with these principles with the goal to maintaining unity in the church family will help us prevent from being legalistic and judgmental. Because pretty soon our convictions seem a lot better than somebody else's and we want to tell them how to live and we have to battle against that. So wow, thanks for hearing me out this morning. These last two sermons are really a product of thought and study over the course of my Christian life for 52 years, but especially as we've been going through the book of Galatians. If no one got anything out of this message, I know God had me at least preach it to myself. So the key thought here is a healthy understanding of our role as Christ followers and following the law of Christ and the Spirit will keep us balanced and unified in our walk with our church family and fellow believers. Three things before we go to prayer. I don't often mention these, but I will today and always have those questions to ponder throughout the week. Some takeaways to consider. Number one, are you able to live comfortably under the law of Christ since you have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you? Can you rest? Can you abide in that? Can you be confident? Or do you feel like you're under the hammer and you've got to do all these things to live up to God's acceptance? Second of all, do you struggle with wanting to impose your convictions on other Christ followers? I've battled that at times in my life. And it's something that we have to uh, find the, the balance and the tension to live with. And thirdly, are you able to be balanced and unified for the common good of the church family even if you can't agree with everyone. You see, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we're called to unity. It doesn't say something we have to conjure up. Paul says, keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We have the unity. It's up to us to maintain it and to keep it and to love our brothers and sisters in Christ for the common good in our church family. Let's bow for prayer. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe God's speaking to you about some areas of your life that you've been kind of judgmental about. Kind of wanting to impose your views on other people. Kind of thinking, boy, if they would only think my way, which I think is God's way, they would be better off. We have to just release that and we have to put it in the Lord's hands. So maybe today if you're struggling with a judgmental spirit, Pray and ask the Lord to forgive you of it and to remove that from you and to walk in the balance of love and unity toward your brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this teaching. Thank you for the, the power of your word. Thank you how you've laid it out very simply for us to understand. It's all so easy to understand it, but it's another thing to obey it. Give us the ability to do that. Some of these things are counterintuitive to our human flesh, to love our enemies, to treat others with respect and dignity when they don't treat us in that way. But Lord, help us. Help us to live out the law of Christ, the law of the Spirit that brings us life. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.